In the latter years of American existence, the country was racked by oil shortages, rising prices, and fears of annihilation as the world slowly fell apart, which spurred on severe social unrest as the American people panicked. Yet at the same time, institutions delved into the sciences and engineering in a desperate bid to save the nation and outclass the communist aggressors with superior American might. This took many forms, producing high-end military products that spilled into the civilian market or vice versa to revitalize the economy in these dark and depressing times, but at the expense of ethics. <laughs> Mad scientist craze began as a side effect of the resource wars, just as many other societal shifts did, with the military looking into new ways to overcome material deficiencies with new technology. This culminated into the Power Armor Project, which was an idea spawned out of the need for heavy mobile firepower to accompany the infantry after crippling fuel shortages had rendered most tanks and armored vehicles inoperable, leaving the United States military in an extremely precarious position. The contract was awarded to the nation's premier defense contractor, West Tech, in 2065, and work was started immediately, with the company dedicating its entire advanced weapons division to the task. But the beginning of the Sino-American War a year later forced the team to rush what they could out the door, resulting in the imperfect but effective T-45. This was first put into production in 2067 as a stopgap solution to slow the Chinese down, but proved wildly successful with power armor units quickly stabilizing the Anchorage front line with their heavy firepower and eventually able to punch back with a counter invasion. But this suit had many problems as it was slapped together on a crunch and mostly utilized existing technologies, so it was bulky, slow, and heavy, making traversing ground difficult even after subsequent upgrades, which rendered the T-45 most useful as a defensive tool to hold the line. West Tech's ultimate goal was the T-51, a refined and much more graceful suit that was the perfect commie stomping machine. It spent a staggering 11 years in development before getting the green light to deploy to the front line in 2076 and changed the war almost overnight, from an attritional slog on both the Alaskan and Chinese fronts to a near rout of the Chinese People Liberation Army out of Alaska and deep into their homeland. The development of power armor was the catalyst that spurred great technological advancements that were required to actually build and operate these battlefield monsters, like the Fusion Cell, a portable handheld fusion generator that was designed by West Tech and intended to be the T-45's power source, but was quickly adapted for other civil and military purposes to power everything from toasters and televisions to high-powered laser weapons and robots. It proved to be a highly successful and versatile power source that expanded American access to cheap, clean, and reliable energy that revolutionized society and decentralized the energy industry. Cars became fusion-powered thanks to Cor Vega, who pioneered this leap which allowed gas stations like Red Rocket to expand their services by providing reactor coolant and nuclear facilities, while at the same time, the fusion cell was being scaled up into the fusion core to provide power to entire buildings and allow them to be taken off the grid and operate for centuries. While other companies like Mass Fusion took the basic concept of fusion and created fully functional industrial fusion reactors to provide abundant and reliable power for commercial use. The advents made from the Power Armor Project transformed America from a fossil fuel based economy into one dominated by the atom. Yet this was not the extent by which West Tech contributed to this new American scientific revolution. By 2073, the company was chosen to lead the Pan Immunity Virum Project thanks to their heavy work into the blue flu over the previous two decades. This was a highly contagious and virulent chemohorragic fever similar to Ebola that had sparked the new plague in 2053 and would eventually kill 400,000 American citizens in the most gruesome fashion. Excessive bleeding from every orifice and liquefaction of internal organs. West Tech's research into this virus put them in a prime position to take on the Pan Immunity Virum Project, 
which had the stated goal of being a universal inoculation against all diseases, bacterial, viral, genetic, radiological, everything to give American soldiers the ultimate advantage in the Sino-American War and assist the shadow government in its endeavors. The project would be initiated after China resorted to using biological and chemical weapons on the battlefield in 2073, sparking fears of another pandemic or worse, the Blue Flu's reemergence. At first, experiments with PVP proved successful, with near-perfect resistance to genetic damage and disruption of protein synthesis within early tests. This was done using a mutagenic megavirus to infect subject animal cells, which forcefully altered their DNA from a double helix to a quadrihelical structure and gave the cell a sheath of ionized hydrogen both of which effectively rendered any cell infected by PVP immune to all viruses and bacteria and radiation-induced damage. But some noteworthy side effects caught the attention of Major Bennett, the military liaison to West Tech who took interest in the increased muscular growth and the replication of cells within subjects, even those that are not supposed to be divided like neurons. Major Bennett saw the military potential in this and immediately ordered further research down this rabbit hole in March 2075. Experiments on flatworms and mice confirmed PVP's potential as an evolutionary agent, and almost all talk of a universal inoculation was dropped for this new path that included renaming the project to the Forced Evolutionary Virus. Tests on white mice noted substantial growth in muscular structures and vital organs, while increases in brain activity spiked relative intelligence to the point where subjects were completing mazes in half the time when compared to the control group. But researchers also noted a substantial increase in aggressiveness within exposed mice. Testing on raccoons followed with FEV batch 11-011, which had been specifically modified to improve cell division efficiency in spite intelligence allowing multiple subjects to escape. Then on chimpanzees, with batch 11-111, each new iteration was slightly altered to improve its performance until the desired outcome was achieved. Simultaneously, as animal trials were being conducted in California, its experiments on plants under the Greenhouse Initiative were beginning at the newly established West Tech Research Center in Huntersville, West Virginia. The Greenhouse Initiative was initiated in 2075 and was the last gasp of the Pan Immunity Virum Project with the hope that the virus's mutagenic properties could be used to create better crops to alleviate the food shortages that have plagued America throughout the resource wars. At first, this was going swimmingly, with the researchers successfully creating multiple crop alterations that increased yield and resistance to both drought and disease, which the company was growing on local farms they had paid testing rights to and had sparked an economic revival within the Huntersville, the previously dying rural mountain town that now benefited greatly from the company's presence and employees frequenting the town when not working. But by February 2076, this quickly ended after a year of prosperity, and townsfolk began to fall ill with what was described as a mysterious flu. In reality, the research facility outside of Huntersville had been retasked with identifying viable samples of FEV for further research and had utilized the town's new water treatment facility to distribute the virus before quarantining the town with hazmat-equipped company security to study the effects of long-term low exposure on an isolated population, thus beginning human experimentation, which would not begin in earnest on the West Coast until a year later in 2077, when the military decided work into FEV had progressed to a sufficient level. All human experimentation along the West Coast was nationalized and relocated to the Mariposa military base in California, and the human specific strain was renamed FEV2, with test subjects gathered from Chinese prisoners of war, Canadian separatists, and American military deserters, none of whom had consented and were forced here against their will as helpless American guinea pigs, just as the residents of Huntersville will, especially as the situation deteriorated and the army loaned elements of the 12th Mountain Division to West Tech Security to do their dirty work. 
In both facilities, specimens were exposed to various forms of FEV and observed. At Mariposa Military Base, they were mostly interested in creating superhumans and focused on increasing the strength and durability of specimens, not just for the military, mind you, but the Enclave too, who had their own nefarious purposes for the virus, which we would cover in a bit. While in Huntersville, West Tech wanted to push the bounds of science by testing multiple different strains of the virus, resulting in some of the most vile creatures and indescribable abominations of science created from abducted hunters' villains multiple of which would eventually escape and haunt West Virginia after the bombs fell. Either way, the involuntary subjects of both facilities suffered greatly. After being dipped into vats of FEV and confined into cells to mutate, some losing all or much of the brain functionality, or growing extra sets of arms and other body parts or worse, as the scientists watched on with notepads at the ready all for the supposed higher purpose of winning the Sino-American War. But in actuality, this was for the Shadow government's personal use as they planned on abandoning the planet to start anew after the Great War and wanted no disease to hamper their efforts. But incomplete research in the fact that FEV sterilizes its hosts foiled this master plan. However, Components of the plan were still carried through thanks to the Voltec Corporation. This was a company founded sometime around the 2020s that advertised itself as a nuclear defense contractor. At the time, this was not a lucrative sector of the market, as not many people were interested in personal nuclear fallout shelters, including the government, so the company would bide its time, taking what jobs it could find including general contracting to pad its wallet out, and eventually acquiring Morgantown Community College to rebrand it as Voltec University in 2031. At first, this continued to operate as a normal community college, just now under the Voltec banner. But as the years wore on and the company became higher profile, normal classes would be stripped and replaced with Voltec specific education courses as the university transitioned into a vocational school for Voltec employees that radically changed every program there, including but not limited to a higher demanding yet expedited medical course that is cut down from 10 years to 3 months, a psychology and leadership program, and construction of a simulation vault dedicated to testing the experiments and hypotheses of students within the overseer program. Voltec University also had a free clinic on campus that offered treatment for degenerative neurological conditions, radiation therapy, and family medicines to local residents that the medical students participated in. The switch to a dedicated vocational school happened when a near-perfect trifecta of events occurred. The Euro-Middle East War turning nuclear, the new plague sweeping through America that killed hundreds of thousands, and the United Nations collapsing as countries around the globe suffered the ill effects of skyrocketing oil prices and savage wars altogether sending massive waves of panic through America. So the federal government started Project Safe House in 2054 to address the first two problems and calm civilians down. volt successfully secured the multi-trillion dollar contract for Safe House thanks to their demonstration vault below Los Angeles that greatly impressed the government who ordered 122 large 1,000 person vaults to be built. This contract cemented Voltec University's status as a school dedicated to training the tidal wave of employees that flooded in to fill out the bloated ranks of Voltec so they could fulfill the Project Safe House obligations, but also brainwash their employees to make them compliant and malleable. At first, Volt design and construction was going smoothly and even inspired technological advancements that sped construction up and allowed most shelters to be finished by 2063. However, sometime during during this nine-year construction spree, the shadow government gained influence over Voltec and shifted designs to fit within their specifications. This necessitated retrofitting old volts and altering future volts to fulfill the designed social experiments turning almost all from bastions of salvation to near total damnation. Most of these experiments focused on scenarios the Enclave thought they may encounter while settling a new planet, like indefinite isolation, which 101 was testing, or the effects of cryopreservation, like in 111 while other vaults focused on innovations the Enclave thought would be beneficial to their effort, like the two different superhuman programs, 87 using FEV and 75 using eugenics to breed a better human, or the agriculture-focused Vault 22, which was dedicated to engineering new and better strains of crops and farming technology to increase productivity across the board, and many more social experiments that the Enclave thought necessary for their master plan. 
But in order to judge how successful an experiment has been, a control sample is required to compare it to. So 17 control volts would be set aside to actually function as proper fallout shelters that had no social experiments like volts 8 and 76, which prospered for the designated 25 years underground before opening up and allowing their dwellers to rebuild society. That left 105 wildly unethical experiments thrust upon their populace that forewent the old question of ethics and science. Do the ends justify the means? Take Volt 19 as an example. This vault was to test the effects of factionalism by segregating its population into two groups, red and blue, that had minimal contact with each other and observe what happened. Both parties became paranoid of one another, often blaming malfunctions in the vault on the other, while strange occurrences like unusual drafts of air, lights flickering, and sporadic noises, including potential subliminal messaging, only increased paranoia and mistrust between the groups. Some even went as far as to accuse the doctors of drugging their patients, but this was chalked up as a diagnosis of psychosis and aggression. This mistrust eventually led to the Volt's collapse, either directly through a civil war or indirectly by lack of maintenance that doomed the populace. Little did they know that this was orchestrated by the dual overseers. Both of them have been manipulating the population under the orders of Votech with the direct goal of cultivating an atmosphere of mistrust and paranoia between both sides. This experiment showed the Enclave that a centralized settlement was superior to dispersed colonization over a wide area each of which may begin to grow wary of the other or strike out on their own ambition. Oddly enough, a similar scenario would play out to this when the White Springs bunker was isolated by communications blackout post-war, which gave former Secretary of Agriculture, now Acting President Thomas Eckhart, the pretext to seize power and attempt to continue the war effort against China without command's approval, eventually leading to their self-destruction after a brief civil war and annihilation of human life in Appalachia. Other experiments like the aforementioned Volt 75 were centered around furthering the Enclave's goals. This time by creating the perfect human specimen through a combination of selective breeding, hormone therapy, and genetic modification. This necessitated using young children who are easily impressionable and controlled. The first group was pulled from Malden, Massachusetts, and families of school-age children were encouraged to enroll thanks to a subsidy program that had been put into place for any family with one or more middle school-aged children. Vault 75 was sold as a safe haven for America's youth, and as such, was constructed under Malden Middle School as a public relations ploy and to ensure maximum attendance. After the vote was sealed during the Great War, the parents, teachers, and older children were executed by vault security under the guise of receiving orientation, leaving just young children ranging from 5 to 14 years old for the experiment. The vault operated vaguely like a military boot camp, where the children are put through daily exercises and drills to build strength and endurance, while they underwent genetic modification and hormone therapy to increase endurance and mental aptitude until they reached 18 years of age, at which time they would graduate as a class and be sent to Uptopland, which is what the adults called the Wasteland. But in actuality, the graduates were either harvested, inducted, or removed. If the graduates were strong and smart, their genes and organs were harvested and put into cryo storage for future study. If they were smart and felt in line, graduates were brought into the science staff to perpetuate the multi-generation long experiment. However, being weak, dumb, or sickly meant you were unceremoniously disposed of and incinerated. Then the next generation would be artificially conceived from the recovered egg and sperm samples, with the scientific staff pairing the best partners together to create the next class of subjects. The experiment of Volt 75 was to create the best specimen by refining the human genome, eliminating genetic defects while bolstering positive traits like intelligence and strength to create a healthy and strong population. The Enclave's intentions were probably to recover the frozen specimens of a perfected human or multiple classes of human and use these to fill their ranks out, raising their next generations of designer humans as either soldiers and scientists for or fully fledged members of the Enclave to rule the wasteland or better yet, colonize Mars as the original plan called for. 
Either way, the plan called for hundreds if not thousands of children to be raised harshly and slain at the prime of their lives, purely for advancement of science and the Enclave's agenda. Most of the social experiments served the Enclave's purposes, unbeknownst to the scientists and staff who conducted and logged the experiments, which allowed the Enclave to gather the data through their one-way back door for their purposes. And finally, there is the Big Mountain Research Center, or Big MT for short. This was another American defense contractor like West Tech, but Big MT was focused purely on advancing technology without restraints. Moral or technological concerns be damned. And thus, many wonderful inventions have their origins within this vast complex, like Saturnite Alloy and the Stealth Suit Mark II, both of which had great potential, but also some questionable inventions, such as the Lobotomite, Night Stalkers, and the Cloud, made this organization a little dubious. Most of these inventions were developed and tested within the Big Mountain Complex, one of these actually vaporizing said mountain that the facility was built into and left a massive crater behind. But the head scientist, known as the Think Tank, Are those penises? simply accepted it as free real estate to expand upon. In the last years of its operation, Big MT would encounter major financial issues that forced the executives to come up with some creative monetary solutions. Part of it involved acquiring cheaper test subjects through the twin projects Burke and Hare in an extra legal way. Project Burke amounted to grave robbing, with teams of workers digging up freshly buried bodies, while Project Hare was allegedly the liquidation of non-military targets to get fresh cadavers, both of which greatly concerned the staff once rumors began to spread. Alongside these was the gathering of living humans for testing, and this was done in cooperation with the army by imprisoning Chinese Americans at the Little Yangtze internment camp. This was in reality a concentration camp of American citizens who were rounded up by Sinophobic legislation that demonized anyone of Chinese descent and was referred to as a human farm by the scientists who routinely abducted subjects for their work usually to extract their brains as Big MT was working on the robot brain at the time, but also for other experiments. And obviously, this greatly worried the internees who frequently attempted to escape, but this problem was solved by a combination of army sentry bots patrolling the perimeter and bomb collars being fitted to each captive that exploded if they left the camp. But other drastic measures did have to be taken to secure further funding and new testing grounds for other inventions. The company's executives would showcase some of their exciting up-and-coming projects at the World Fair, with the hopes of attracting outside parties to sell their technology and expertise to behind the government's back. Frederick Sinclair would be their largest client by far, and purchase many experimental technologies like the Matter Reconverter in an exchange for opening up his grand Sierra Magic Casino as a proving ground for Big MT. A terrible mistake on his part because unbeknownst to him, deadly trials would be conducted throughout his private city like the cloud toxin being released within the villa's climate control facilities and experimental hazmat suits being Big MT's answer to see their effectiveness in the cloud. These were not all that were tested here. Cosmic knights made out of Saturnite alloy could slice a cutting board in half while the streets of the villa were lined with prototype matter recombinators, which are special vending machines that only took Sierra Madre chips that contained a power source and all the material needed to produce anything it had a schematic for. Effectively a 3D printer of food, drink, and medicine that is at the user's fingertips. Aside from these, Dr. Boros, head of the XH research facility and part of the think tank, dabbled in genetic manipulation and creating many of the abominations that wandered the Mojave wasteland. Night Stalkers, a crossbreed between coyotes and rattlesnakes, gigantic tarantula wasps called cazadors, and the fungus Buveria morticana, I don't speak Latin, that was designed for pest control, but could infect and control human hosts in a zombie-like fashion, or create a Venus flytrap-like plant that would hurl spore balls and bite anything that gets close to it. This fungus would be the downfall of Vault 22, and the survivors of which spread it all the way to Zion Canyon, but its origins 
would be within the X-22 Botanical Gardens, where Patient Zero resides, while other Horde creatures are confined exclusively to the crater, such as the Y-17 Trauma Override Harness that pilots the skeletons of their long-dead testers and the Bottomites, who are abducted wastelanders that have had all of their major organs replaced with electronic equivalents, which have made them psychotic and will attack anything on site when they are not performing maintenance duties on a big MT. Beyond these crazy experiments, many unique weapons were dreamt up here. The Proton Axe was a prototype military melee weapon that utilized a stabilized arc of plasma for its blade that can cut through any armor and sear flesh, or the K9000 Cyberdog Gun that is a 357 Magnum minigun with the brain of a dog held within, allowing it to assist the user to locate targets thanks to its ears and nose, which is designed for the tight confines of urban warfare. Alongside this is the LAER, or Laser Assisted Electrical Rifle, which uses lasers to superheat the air into a conductive plasma conduit to deliver a bolt of electricity onto the target. And most destructive, in my opinion, are the 16-inch Saturnite artillery shells that are designed to be armor-piercing and fired from the big guns of American battleships and would be incredibly useful for the bunker-busting role during the 10-year-long Battle of Anchorage or bombarding Shanghai and Shantou where the Marines were besieged for almost two years. These are only some of the most perverse scientific institutes found in America. From the orderly and clean laboratories of West Tech, where power armor was developed and PVP designed, to the dark dungeons vaults that are sold under the skies of salvation, and the utter chaos of Big Mountain with their wild and evil experiments. All three disregard ethics for their scientific pursuits and what they perceive as higher purposes, whether that be financial, scientific, or for the new world order. The organizations have sidestepped all legal consequences to pursue their bottom line. What do you think of these three companies? Do you have any thoughts or ideas about West Tech, Voltech, or Big MT? If so, leave them in the comments down below, and don't forget to like and subscribe as well, and I will see you in the next video.